Um, our next speaker is Dr. Rob Moller. Dr. Rob Moller received his DBM from Oklahoma State University and then joined the United States Army. While in the Army, he completed a residency in pathology and was assigned to various military research installations, including the AFIP, USAMRRIID, and USAMRICD. After retiring from the military, Dr. Moller took a faculty position with UC Davis and worked at both the Tulare and San Bernardino branches. During his veterinary career, his interests are in infectious diseases, particularly in neonatal cattle, foreign animal diseases, and toxicological issues. Dr. Moller is currently semi-retired and works part-time for the California Animal Health and Food Safety Laboratory System. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Robert Moller with his talk on African horse sickness, Rift Valley fever, and Pessy de Petit Ruminant. It's uh, great to speak to everybody. Uh, uh, welcome from uh, Central California. Uh, as we call it, the, the dairy land and poultry capital of California and really the United States where we see uh, a lot of dairy animals as well as uh, significant uh, poultry cases uh, due to the uh, number of uh, chickens, both broilers and layers that are laid in this area. So uh, today, <clears throat> I would like to talk about three uh, inter really interesting diseases and uh, look at uh, possibly where these diseases are traveling and where they have been in the recent past so that uh, people recognize that the, these diseases uh, are uh, significant, have, have some significant potential of spreading and if get established in the area could cause significant issues. So let's go through and we'll first start with African horse sickness. Uh, if, uh, like uh, Dr. Uzal, uh, if you have a question, uh, hopefully I will be able to see a question if it uh, comes up uh, and I'll try to answer it uh, at that time uh, as we cover each uh, little group of diseases. Uh, I got a short amount of time to cover uh, these diseases. Uh, so I hopefully I'll be able to go through and won't get uh, distracted and uh, go off on a tangent on these diseases because that, that is quite easily to do. So our first one is African horse sickness. Uh, this is a non-contagious arboviral disease of equines. It's an orbivirus uh, in which there are nine distinct serotypes uh, which uh, with cross reaction between one and uh, serotype one and two, three and seven, five and eight, and six and nine. Uh, there's no cross reaction with other orbiviruses. Uh, the most significant orbiviruses that we have out there, of course, are blue tongue and episodic hemorrhagic disease. Uh, Ibarki disease is seen, I believe now it's called e uh, episodic hemorrhagic disease type two. Uh, then there's an equine encephalo. Uh, encephalosis, which is a very closely related to African horse sickness in clinically, but then again, uh, they are antigenically distinct. And then of course we have Peruvian horse sickness and uh, LZ virus. LZ virus of course is in Australia and Peruvian horse sickness, which is in obviously Peru. Uh, it's real interesting, these viruses are thousands of miles apart, yet very closely related. And these uh, tend to cause more of a neurological issue in horses. Uh, African horse sickness is not considered a zoonotic agent. However, retinitis and encephalitis has been observed in laboratory workers exposed to modified live uh, vaccine. It's never killed anybody, but if you do use the vaccine, be careful. It is also considered a select agent here in the United States. Uh, of course, as I said, this is a, a disease of horses or, or really equine uh, species, uh, uh, equids, and susceptibility varies with the horse being the most susceptible and the zebra being the least susceptible to disease. In fact, zebras usually are asymptomatic. Donkeys and mules, of course, have variable uh, disease and probably depending on uh, genetics as well as uh, potential past exposure to the virus. Mortality rates vary. Horses, of course, are very high. 
uh, between 70 and 95 percent, with it dropping down to 10 percent in Asian donkeys. African donkeys and zebras tend to have a subclinical infection with mild fever. Horses tend to be viremic for four to 21 days, with uh, zebras being the probable reservoir, with viremia lasting up to 40 days in clinical uh, cases or in, uh, in challenged cases. I suspect out in large herds of zebras, this may last longer in, in the wild, and we may have uh, the potential reservoir. Uh, other animals uh, potentially as reservoirs has not really been investigated real thoroughly. Uh, dogs have gotten the disease. Uh, we've had several paracute fatal infections with dogs eating African swine or African horse sickness virus infected horse meat. And in 2013, there was an infection without ingestion of horse meat. Uh, one of the probable reasons dogs don't get it is uh, culicoides tend to not prefer dogs. Uh, however, it is unlikely dogs will play a role in transmission of the virus. Camels have gotten rare and apparent diseases and it's experimentally infected vervet monkeys with a vaccine strain with a documented encephalitis. Uh, serologically, uh, goats, African elephants and black and white rhinoceroses have all seroconverted to this, these viruses. A little map of geographical distribution. Uh, this disease primarily houses or homes in uh, Southern Africa, where my red dot, a circle is, with recent outbreaks occurring in South Africa in 16, 19, 20, and 21. Uh, Chad in 2018. Uh, a concerning outbreak uh, was in 2020 in uh, Malaysia area uh, and uh, Thailand uh, that occurred. Uh, so this virus can spread with, with importation of zebras as well as horse travel from various different areas. Uh, that was very much the case back in 1990 when uh, a case was identified out here with the transport of zebras to Spain, which took about a year, year and a half to get that under control. Uh, of course, as I say, this is not a contagion by contact, but the virus is seen, found in the semen, urine, and all secretions of infected animals. They tend to be very viremic, so there is some potential of spread if you are exposed to the blood as well as urine and semen. Culicoides imicola tends to be the uh, most common uh, vector for this disease. And, the, and in culicoides, they tend to be transovarian transmission. In North America, uh, culicoides verapinus is a very efficient vector for the disease. Two, the interesting thing and concerning thing, as, as time goes in transportation and movement of animals and uh, people throughout the world, Culicoides imicola is spreading its range uh, throughout uh, Africa. I believe it's now in Southern uh, Europe and co very common in the Middle East. Uh, so uh, people should need to be or our uh, federal people need to be very uh, aware that this fire or this uh, culicoides is moving about. Mosquitoes uh, such as Culex and Ophelis and 80 species, as well as ticks, biting flies, are suspected of transmission of the virus. And they tend to be more of a transmitted host and don't necessarily replicate the virus uh, efficiently uh, within their system. The disease is both seasonal, late summer and autumn, and can be a, have an episodic cycle of incidents. The disease is associated often with drought followed by heavy rains, kind of like what we expect to see with flu tongue here in the States. The pathogenesis 
of this disease is uh, African horse sick is inoculated by infected Culicordes. The virus travels to regional lymph nodes where it replicates in lymphocytes and monocytes and disseminates throughout the body via the blood as a viremia. Subsequent infections tend to replicate in macrophages, lymphocytes, then endothelial cells uh, during the secondary viremia uh, where we get damage to endothelial cells and significant vascular leakage. Uh, of course, uh, the significant problems with these animals is activation of basoactive amine, uh, basoactive cytokine mediators, which could cause serious injury in the animal. Clinical disease uh, varies from the strain uh, of African swine fever or African horse sickness that hits. Uh, the species involve uh, intrinsic factors such as innate resistance, species, breed, gender, age, immunity, uh, all kind of affect how severe the disease is going to get. Incubation period is seven to 14 days. Uh, OIE terrestrial code says it can be up to 40 days, but most cases tend to be seven to 14 days after exposure. Uh, viremia corresponds with fevers. Fevers can be uh, variable with most between 104 to 106 or 40 to 41 degrees Celsius. Uh, the disease is uh, what you see tends to be reddening of the conjunctiva, swelling of the supraorbital fossa, eyelids, facial uh, tissues, as well as neck, thoracic, brisket, and shoulders. Dipsia cough may occur. It's rare, but it can occur. Dilated uh, nostrils with frothy fluid is common at the end of life of these animals, followed by collapse and death, usually within seven days of clinical signs. Uh, they, they break this disease out into multiple areas of this disease. And while that, that's an okay way to look at this, the times I've seen African horse sickness I could never really speciate a acute respiratory pulmonary form from a subacute cardiac form or mixed form. I, I tend to call most of them all a mixed form, particularly if the animal dies. Uh, but again, what we see are these high fevers up to 41 to, uh, degrees Celsius uh, with swelling of the face, the superorbital fossa, neck, head, brisket area. Uh, Sometimes we'll get respiratory distress. This usually occurs very acutely within an hour of death. You may see red and conjunctivas. And then of course they talk about the mixed form where you see both, which is great when you have more of a chance of saying, yep, this is uh, African horse sickness. Uh, what we see here is depression in the horse, the fever. This may last several days and you really don't see anything. However, many times what we'll get is in the superorbital fossa uh, a lesion. Uh, horse again here, superorbital fossa, edema of the eyelids. Look, look at the edema in this uh, one here to all the far right. Uh, you can have some reddening from scleral injection, and of course, facial edema is what we see here. Uh, a significant case here, look, look at this horse here with fa significant facial edema, superorbital fossa swelling, uh, these eyes, lids are awful swollen. When the horse recovered, look the difference between the two horses, how they look. Uh, this, this edema can be very uh, significant in these horses. Of course, uh, the uh, horse that develop respiratory forms, as I said, the respiratory form tends to be very acute with a horse literally collapsing or becoming distressed for about an hour or two, maybe, uh, maybe have some signs of colic, then followed by significant collapse and the release of all this fluid throughout the nostrils. How many of us have had a horse come to them that we've seen this? While this is not pathognomonic for this disease, whenever I see this, I think, could this horse be African horse sickness? Could this horse be the first case here in Tulare County and the United States. So when you see this, just always think African horse sickness. Uh, 
the uh, pathologic findings. What we see here, of course, they talk about the cardiac edematous form being significant edema of the muscles of the neck uh, region. You may see some in the chest region too. That's much more rare. Epicardial hemorrhages. You'll, they call it a myocarditis in the literature, but really, in many ways, this is much more just necrosis in these uh, animals. And of course, a hemorrhagic gastritis. The uh, respiratory form, we see significant interlobular edema, hydropericardium uh, with pleural effusions, edema of the thoracic lymph nodes, particular hemorrhages on the epicardium or pericardium and epicardium. Then, of course, uh, hemorrhages and hyperemia seen in the intestine of, of these animals. So lesions uh, that we see, of course, uh, edema in the neck and nuchal around the neck region, around the nuchal ligament. This is a very uh, common lesion that you don't see in many other cases. The only time I've ever seen this uh, significantly in horses has been with type C botulism. I've never seen it with type A or B or D botulism. It seems to be very common though in type C botulism too. So uh, this edema, if it's there, is very nice to see and should keep, should tweak your mind. I better look at this case a little more closely. The uh, pulmonary edema uh, uh, and uh, thoracic uh, effusions are there. There's a little edema in the uh, uh, thoracic cavity and the muscles around the back there. Uh, pulmonary edema, significant rib uh, expansion of the lung with rib impressions. Uh, you may see interlobular edema too, uh, very prevalent in these horses. It's, uh, it's quite uh, pronounced in horses that uh, develop this pulmonary respiratory form. Uh, of course, tracheal fluid uh, is there, obviously, particularly if you have massive uh, loss of fluid uh, through the nostrils. Heart, significant pericardial effusions. You'll see epicardial hemorrhages in there. Uh, occasionally, if you look real hard and put your imaginative scope on, when we do pathology growth, I'll see pale pallor areas in the heart. This, I don't believe, is a lesion. This, this area would be nice to call that, but I think this is a fibrous band in the heart of this, uh, in this heart. But you can see pallor areas in, in the uh, uh, heart, it makes you wonder if maybe there isn't necrosis. And of course, when you look at the heart, you'll see these areas of myocardial, quite, uh, almost coagulative necrosis with some uh, inter uh, edema and necrosis and maybe a little bit of inflammation present in these areas. Uh, I see this lesion, this looks classic like blue tongue to me. In, in, uh, the sheep that I, I will see when we get blue tongue out here. Uh, other lesions that we see is gastric hemorrhages, swollen lymph nodes, uh, petechial neck bionic hemorrhages over cerebral surfaces. Uh, just the lesions, what we call the mixed form, edema here in the neck, in the lungs, uh, trachea here has some edema, and then gastric hemorrhages too. Uh, differentials. Uh, this uh, is a differential uh, list that uh, OIE puts out for this disease. Anthrax, maybe. Uh, I've never seen a case of anthrax in a horse that, that I wouldn't know them. Probably anthrax. But the pulmonary edema uh, may, may suggest that. Uh, equine infectious anemia and viral arteritis prominent swelling of the neck and, and pectoral regions uh, would suggest possibly that. Uh, trypanosomiasis, sura, edema again. Equine encephalosis, uh, these horses tend to get edema in the face and in the neck region, but they don't tend to die. Uh, pyroplasmosis, uh, babesia, and tyleria uh, could, uh, uh, be 
uh, a differential, but again, these uh, would be uh, more edema uh, from that. Purple hemorrhagica, the hemorrhages, the uh, possible hemorrhage and edema in the lungs would be a good one. Hendra virus would pot, could be a possibility too uh, out there. Of course, type C botulism, the edema in the neck. Monensin toxicity would be high, particularly with the cardiac lesions and the thoracic effusions. Then acute anaphylactic reactions would be a differential too. So you, you need to be thinking about this uh, all the time. That is all, all I have to really say in sh my short time on African horse sickness, and, and at least give you an exposure to what, what to think about this disease. The next is Rift Valley fever. Uh, I've worked with Rift Valley fever and vaccine development. I, I really like this virus. This is a, a really exciting virus. It's a flebo virus of the Bunyavirity group. There's one serotype with multiple strains. The virus is very stable. Uh, it can be uh, stable at four degrees Celsius for many months. It survives in an aerosol form at 23 degrees Celsius uh, and 50% to 85% humidity. So it, it, it stays uh, quite, it, it's quite a stable virus. It survives in arthropod eggs uh, during inter, uh, epidemic periods, uh, in dry periods. It survives in 5% phenol, uh, at four degrees Celsius for six months. So it, it's a, a very stable virus that has uh, some concern, both for animals that are infected with this and, and humans who may be, uh, uh, be uh, close to those animals and maybe eating those animals. Uh, biological vectors are 80s, uh, uh, Kulak species, and Anopheles, 80s reservoir horse for transylvarian transmission and is essential for maintaining Rift Valley fever in endemic areas. The other virus, uh, others, uh, well, 80s Kulax and Anopheles mosquitoes in North America can experimentally uh, act as vectors for Rift Valley fever. Uh, Stomoxis uh, flies and midges and turbanas are important mechanical vectors, but they don't maintain the virus over long times. And then always worry about aerosolized transmission because of the high viremic loads in these animals that are infected. Recent outbreaks, uh, this tends to be an African disease. Uh, recent out outbreaks have occurred. It has spilled over in Saudi Arabia in, tw in 2021. It's been seen in Madagascar 21. Uh, recent outbreaks currently right now are in more West Africa and uh, East Africa over here uh, that have been occurring uh, on and appear to be continuing this year to and probably will continue uh, throughout the rest of this year, particularly the rainy season. Uh, the primary species affected are cattle, sheep, and goats uh, and camels. Uh, buffalo tend to be uh, affected too, and these less so. Cattle. Uh, Camels have, tend to have a subclinical disease, but they do tend to abort. Uh, horses and swine tend to be subclinical uh, and rarely abort. Dogs can become infected with abortions, and puppies and kittens are highly susceptible. So if you're having significant abortion storms in cattle, sheep, and goats, and abortion storms in, in, in dogs and cats in the area, get a little worried that you may have uh, transplanted uh, Rift Valley fever into your area. Humans are very susceptible uh, to infections. Protect yourself. And then also, uh, infected animals have high viral loads in blood and possibly milk. They have identified in this. So the potential of transmitting the disease in unpasteurized milk is a possibility. And again, suspect Rift Valley fever in high rates of abortion and neonatal deaths. And be careful if you're slaughtering during home slaughter at this, as well as uh, abattoir slaughters too, if you're in an infected area. Clinical signs, uh, as I stated, uh, usually affects animals seven to 10 days. 
They tend to get a high fever of 40 to 41 degrees Celsius, uh, Celsius which may be biphasic. Animals become listless, depressed, anorectic. They can develop a blood, bloody diarrhea, as in, as in this code over here, as well as uh, increased lacrimation, nasal discharges, and excessive salivation. Salivations, as, as in this code over here. Uh, animals become weak, followed by death. Mortality can be up to 70 to 100% in very young animals. Lambs and kids and calves less than a week old can have a 90% mortality. Uh, animals over two weeks, the mortality drops. Calves, again, mortality depending on the age and breed of animal that's involved. Uh, clinical signs in adult uh, animals, they develop a high fever, uh, lasts 24 to 40, to 40 or 96 hours. They have a fall of milk production, become anorectic, may have C weakness and salivation, nasal discharges. They may get abdominal pain, have a, a bloody diarrhea. Some animals may become icteric. And of course, you'll have abortion storms in, in the affected herd. If you do uh, liver enzymes are elevated, you see a leukopenia in these animals. Most tend to recover with death in a small percentage. Remember, animals are viremic with high viral loads in the blood and milk. So be careful if you do post these animals. Wear proper PPE uh, if you can. Gross lesions, of course, are abortion storms. Uh, grossly, uh, examining the external part of the animal. It may look like this calf here uh, with just meconium over the surface, suggesting maybe some fetal stress in the animal. Large number of newborns dying suddenly is what you would expect. Again, you may see interest in these animals, but oftentimes these animals die very uh, quickly. Looking at the liver, uh, tend to have some necrosis in it. Uh, what we'll see here is a pallor areas with more congested areas. You may see in the lungs some pulmonary edema too. Other uh, lesions, uh, which would be more commonly seen in animals uh, that have had a prolonged disease uh, are particular hemorrhages in the abomasum uh, here, uh, particular hemorrhages over the, and ecmonic hemorrhage over cirrhosal surfaces over the spleen, the urinary bladder, and hemorrhages in the gallbladder too. So we can see multiple uh, lesions. And most of this hemorrhage that we see, I believe is probably due to DIC crisis due to, due to the viral load and damage to the liver. Histopathology, uh, what we see is uh, liver lesions uh, that can be uh, multifocal in nature, they tend to start out mid-zone and then spread from there. It can be, be severe and lobular involving multiple uh, lobules uh, in these animals. We see these areas as significant lytic necrosis there. Occasionally we will see intranuclear inclusions. These are very uh, rare though. Uh, if you see them, take a picture. Uh, and of course you can see significant viral load, uh, virus present in the, in the hepatocytes in these necrotic areas. Uh, there's significant splenic necrosis and lymphoid necrosis, as you can see with this, uh, necrosis of lymphocytes. And of course, if you look at them, uh, I do immunohistochemistry in macrophages, we'll find uh, the uh, virus present where it's replicating. Uh, Rift Valley fever in humans, most humans, tend to get a flu-like syndrome uh, with temperatures of up to 40 degrees Celsius. They develop headache, muscle joint pain, weakness, vomiting, abdominal pain. Uh, a certain percentage will develop a hemorrhagic syndrome with fever, uh, with hemorrhages and jaundice. You can see this poor young lady here. You can see the hemorrhages over surfaces, the ecmonic and hemorrhages and bruising. Worse yet, worst nightmare, this lady's pregnant. Uh, some people develop a retinitis uh, with blind spots are present. Uh, they develop photophobia, uh, then orbital pain, and a small percentage of people develop 
encephalitis with headaches, stiffness, disorientation, uh, vertical uh, present on these animals. Uh, this is a significant lesion uh, that can happen and it can be quite severe from times. Uh, but usually, fortunately, in humans, uh, they tend to survive. Abortions are suspected, but have never been proven in humans to occur. However, I would suspect, based on our placentation, that it could very easily occur in these uh, fetuses. Differentials uh, on Rift Valley fever are blue tongue, uh, mainly because of uh, maybe some swelling and edema in the nasal areas. Uh, Enterotoxemia due to sudden death. Uh, weasel brown disease, again, that one uh, tends to be uh, death uh, with this. Uh, of course, the others are lepto, vibrio, brucella, uh, chlamydia here, uh, just abortion storms that are possible. And really, for me, it's vibrio, chlamydia would be the two big ones that, that I would worry where we see significant abortion storms. Brucellosis is out there uh, in areas where brucella is not controlled. I definitely one would, would keep that in there too. Uh, I did not put in Q fever, mainly because the placenta on those animals uh, has that very characteristic look, which uh, I don't feel you would uh, differentiate from uh, this disease uh, occurring. However, you could have Q fever in with those animals too. Nairobi sheep disease would look very similar. It's a flavy virus. Uh, th this disease has significant liver necrosis that you would expect to see uh, in these animals. Heart water, again, sudden death uh, in these animals. Uh, young animals would be the mostly affected. PPR again, uh, which we'll talk later. That could be in there, but, but again, this these animals would develop severe enteritis uh, uh, in these animals, as well as stomatitis uh, and death. And, and grossly, we or histologically and grossly, we would obviously tell the difference. And of course, bacterial septicemia is out there too. Uh, would would uh, lead to issues that could mimic that. But again, histopathology and gross should. Uh, leave those out. So that, that is a little short introduction to Rift Valley fever for everyone. Uh, it, it's quite a disease. Uh, it can have devastating results. And it's one that we need to be worried about and protect ourselves uh, because you don't want to be uh, a case report for our, our human counterparts. And if you do end up being a case report, be sure you're second offer. Uh, the next uh, one I'd like to talk about is Pesta de Petit Ruminants and, and a little bit about render pests. Render pests, of course, is eradicated from the world. However, it is still present in various labs throughout the world. Uh, hopefully, it is fairly well uh, controlled. Uh, these are mobility viruses. PPR has one serotype with four lineages. Render pests, of course, is eradicated declared free of it since May of 2011. Both diseases have very similar characteristics with other morbillary viruses. Here are the morbillary viruses out. And, and here's sort of the family tree of morbillary viruses in animals. I, I tend to like to call PPR or PCD piece room not. I like really, I would intertwine that uh, branch of the virus because it has so many characteristics of all the others. So uh, when we look at this disease, uh, it, it it shows similarities of of, of morbillary viruses in in our cetaceans, our pinnipeds, our canids, as well as somewhat to render pests and and measles in humans. So uh, it, it's quite a, a disease. And in many ways, it kind of mimics measles in man to a very uh, good extent. 
other than the neurological form. There we go. There we go. Uh, the virus is spread uh, via aerosol. And it's identified in the respiratory tract, urinary tract, and intestinal tract. So it's spread mostly by direct contact with respiratory and lacrimal secretions. But don't forget about urine as well as feces. Uh, it's highly contagious and can be spread easily in naive animals. The virus usually enters the respiratory tract or pharyngeal regions. The virus replicates in the tonsillar regions, transfers to lymphoid organs in their oropharyngeal region, and then to regional lymph nodes. From there, the virus then spreads um, and becomes viremic and spreads to other lymphoid tissues and epithelial cells, where, where consequently where we see significant lesions. Uh, remember the virus attacks both the lymphoid tissues as well as epithelium, the respiratory tract, the GI tract, and, and the urinary tract. So expect lesions to see in all three of those areas. And again, they said the CNS is not affected. And as far as I know, uh, it is not affected uh, part, which makes it somewhat unusual compared and very similar to render pests uh, in that these animals do not develop a CNS signs, whereas the other mobility viruses, we can get uh, CNS signs. Uh, just a little uh, host range between render pests and PPR. The render pest tends to be in our larger animals, uh, larger uh, bovids or, or ruminants, whereas pests the petite ruminants tends to be more in sheep and goats. And others tend to be sub, uh, subclinical infections. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> definition of PPR is an acute or subacute contagious viral disease of sheep and goats characterized by high fever, conjunctivitis, rhinitis, necrotizing stomatitis, gastroenteritis, and pneumonia. So if you think about it as that, uh, you, you'll get a better appreciation for this disease. It was first discovered on the Ivory Coast in 1942. Uh, it is spread throughout Africa, the Middle East, Turkey, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, India, China, and the Asian subcontinent. As I said, there are four lineages with three of them remaining primarily in Africa, with the fourth lineage, lineage four, being the one that is spread out of Africa. Mortality can vary with susceptible population. Of course, with the young, naive animals being anywhere between 50 and 100% mortality. Here's a sort of a map of where uh, these viruses are found. Uh, outbreaks have occurred mostly in North Africa in the past several years. Uh, in uh, Syria, Middle East region. It's been up here in Turkey. It's a little bit occasionally found in Eastern Europe up here. But it hasn't been reported in the past few years. Uh, big outbreaks have occurred here in Thailand, uh, this region in 2020, in China in 2020 and 2021 in the Mongolian region. So this virus is spreading and it has the potential of uh, coming to various areas. It can be spread on feet. So it could very easily be spread in areas of, of the world where people have traveled and brought back on their shoes and, and clothing fairly easy. Clinical signs uh, of the virus, incubation three to four uh, to 15 days, most seven or four to six days most often, high fevers of 41 to 42 degrees Celsius. Uh, you usually have a serous followed by mucopurulent nasal discharge and ocular discharges, uh, congestion of the oral mucosa, then followed by a necrotic stomatitis. This occurs one to two days after onset of fever. Animals develop a severe di diarrhea two to three days after onset of the fever. This is followed by increased respiratory rate, coughing, sneezing, uh, 
and due to a pneumonia. Dehydration follows, followed by emaciation and death seven to, days, seven to 10 days after onset of disease. Here are the lesions that we see. Uh, we see conjunctivitis in these animals, uh, lacrimation. You can see this animal has significant lac lacrimation and then followed by a nasal discharge. The interesting thing, if you see these animals, you can swab these, place it on a uh, uh, slide and look for syncytial cells. Uh, oops. Uh, you can look for these syncytial cells in there uh, in the conjunctiva and see them quite easily with a difficult stain. But here's the histopathology of these. You can see the epithelium is quite involved with syncytial cells and intranuclear inclusions present. The stomatitis is out here too, uh, varies from just slight frothing in the mouth to more significant disease of the lips uh, and gums. Uh, where you see severe uh, erosions present. Uh, again, uh, slide in impressions of this may uh, identify uh, uh, syncytial cells in these areas too uh, when, when looking at these. These animals are really sick and look pretty uh, pathetic. Enterocolitis. Oh, uh, uh, enterocolitis occurs in these animals. Uh, we so see uh, usually a severe enteritis. Uh, you may see fibrin present uh, within the colon or in, in the intestine. Occasionally necrosis or, and, and hemorrhage, but that is fairly rare. The interesting thing, when you look at these uh, in intestines, <clears throat> you can see large numbers of <clears throat> infected cells uh, with intranuclear inclusions. Syncytial cells are often common too. And these, as, as you can see further down uh, in this uh, case. Pneumonia occurs uh, in these animals. You may find inclusions uh, in the trachea, rare, but in the, the lungs, you'll see a severe pneumonia, a viral pneumonia with prominent consolidation of the lungs these animals. If you see fibrin, things like this, suspect bacterial uh, infections uh, associated with this, as well as edema present. Histologically, uh, we'll see large uh, consolidation of the lung with lymphocytes, neutrophils present, and large numbers of syncytial cells with intranuclear inclusion present. You can also find uh, syncytial cells in other tissues. Uh, look closely at the hepatic uh, parenchyma as well as bile ducts, where you'll find syncytial cells in intracytoplasmic or intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions present. <clears throat> Our differential, of course, uh, is, is here. Uh, again, this is what uh, OIE considers differential for this. Uh, uh, contagious caprine pleural pneumonia, possibly due to the pneumonia seen in the AIDS animals and the respiratory distress. Uh, bacterial pneumonias, of course, are would be high on my list too. Uh, but then uh, they may also occur secondary to PPR uh, in these animals. Contagious ectoma uh, and sheep pox, they're put in here mainly because of the respiratory components that can occur, particularly sheep pox, contagious eczema for the oral lesions seen. However, I think uh, we would identify these as more proliferative lesions than what you would expect to see with more erosive lesions that you see with PPR. Blue tongue, uh, of course, <clears throat> would be there mainly because of the uh, uh, lesions in the oral cavity. Uh, heart water, due to the pulmonary edema. Foot and mouth disease would be high in, uh, on our list too because of the oral lesions seen uh, in that. However, as the disease progress, I think you'd get it further away from foot and mouth disease. Uh, parasitic diseases uh, or bacterial enteritis, you can't always rule out. Uh, Nairobi sheep disease, again, 
uh, mainly because of uh, the young animals involved. Render pests, of course, we always have to keep it on uh, back of our mind, as well as toxicities uh, present in there. So while, while they give a, a large uh, differential for this, really blue tongue uh, and pulmonary pathogens would be high, and enteric diseases would be high on my list and as potential differentials. But of course, when you look at those diseases histologically, your differential would rapidly decrease. <clears throat> With that uh, is all I have left uh, is I'd like to thank people for giving me pictures. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, people, uh, particularly Mitt Wally, uh, White, Fauzi, Muhammad, Odat Hali, and uh, Kamoya uh, for giving me wonderful slides and, and helping me get a better handle on PPR, even though I've seen it. It's nice to get experience of seeing it out in the field. And then, of course, uh, Dr. or Kathy Apicelli and, and Ethan McNell for taking photos of, of these diseases, too. And then, of course, I'd always like to fa I thank participants of the FADL courses uh, at uh, Plum Island uh, for the fine photos that we get because uh, they're there to participate in uh, learning about these diseases. So does anybody have any questions? I got, what, about five minutes that I can answer? If anybody has a question and would like to post on a Q&A or the chat. We'll chat to uh, see if anybody has anything. Uh, let's see. Anybody have anything to ask? Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I kind of hurried through it. Uh, it's it's hard to cover uh, three you know three diseases uh, like this, but really those three diseases are very critical and, and they're known to travel. African uh, horse sickness can travel uh, horses that travel worldwide. Uh, and then, of course, the bringing of zebras into different areas of the world could very easily get this and get it established and make it very difficult to get rid of. Our, uh, Rift Valley fever tends to be more of a dry climate, uh, but if those would get uh, established in your mosquito uh, in your mosquito population, particularly in mosquitoes that could uh, maintain the virus and transmit it transversely we could have significant uh, problems with that. And then of course, PPR is a spreading disease that's spreading worldwide that we need to be constant vigil, uh, vigilant about. One here. Oh, okay. Uh, how, how to handle a problem if we found a suspected case of Rift Valley fever in the area that has never occurred? That, that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> We here in Central California have a very much of a Mediterranean climate, such as Southern Africa does, uh, very dry summers uh, with wet springs and falls and winters and cool. Uh, so mosquitoes tend to be around year round. Uh, the, the, the important thing is, is early diagnosis. If, uh, and for you to look at that, case and send it to the authorities where, where they can actually grow the virus and do EM where you'll see huge numbers of virus particles present uh, because it's, it's everywhere, uh, particularly in the liver. And, and to get a handle on it quickly so that uh, they can spray for mosquitoes and try to get the incident down. I suspect uh, Rift Valley fever would go uh, several months, particularly in a uh, area where uh, diagnostics is 
less than optimal. Uh, I don't know if in other areas, uh, particularly Australia, however, in the United States, uh, people tend to not bring cases to us if they're more than 50 miles away uh, from the lab. Well, what was 50 miles, 90 kilometers about. So uh, that, that's always an issue. Okay, uh, I got another question here. Uh, Oh, attenuated vaccines may be controversial or have disadvantages. Disadvantages, well, inactive vaccines are not necessarily effective or suitable for emergency purposes, especially variant forms. Uh, the, uh, no, of course, vaccinating in African horse sickness free areas, I would not recommend. Uh, <clears throat> these diseases, I think, to vaccinate uh, and particularly using an attenuated vaccine. Uh, I think we don't want to use vaccines that particularly are not markered so that if, if I come up with a positive case, can I tell if it's a vaccinated animal or an animal that's infected? Uh, so with a lot of these diseases, unless you're in an outbreak, I don't think you'd want the vaccine. The attenuated vaccine, uh, uh, attenuated vaccines, I think, are, are pretty good. But in, like in African horse sickness and, and, and Rift Valley fever, both can be very dangerous. They're obviously not uh, tested on people. And uh, uh, they could be dangerous. So just always be careful. And appreciate my view on future directions of role of vaccines in, in countries. Uh, I think it's important for us to develop vaccines uh, and get the techniques down so that we can, uh, how should I say it, respond to any potential danger that's out there quickly. Hopefully, as we develop more and more vaccines, particularly, I think, uh, with uh, our, our recent uh, outbreak of SARS that we've had, I think may spur more uh, rapid vaccine development. And hopefully, we won't see pandemics like uh, this again. And then I have a question. Do I think PPR will continue to spread across Asia? Yes, I think it will. I think it's pretty now endemic and with travel of uh, small ruminants from country to countries and, and the porosity of borders in much of the uh, of Central Asia, I, I, if it isn't there, it will be there in the near future. Uh, see, would you expect to see internuclear inclusions in uh, PPR like uh, distemper? Yes. I would expect to see uh, intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions, and you can find it, uh, find them quite easily. Uh, the nice thing about PPR, uh, which is a little different from render pests, is that render pests, the animals would get sick, they'd develop a severe enteritis quickly, and the virus, uh, the virus would be uh, still present, but the intranuclear inclusions are absent and make it very difficult to detect, and, and the, the disease will look a lot like BVD uh, with the severe necrosis of the Pyrus patch. Uh, so uh, we're, we're real fortunate with this is that you see it, you say, my God, this looks like distemper, and you'd be thinking PPR. They say, is there any reason for African horse sickness to cause edema, particularly in the head and neck and not other areas? Uh, I, I do not see edema in other areas. This is very specific to the head and neck region, and it may have something to do with the horse, uh, the vascular system of, of how a horse goes, but I've never seen uh, African horse sickness uh, involved in the back muscles or the leg, uh, rear leg muscles, or that matter, any edema down uh, in, the, in the lower legs like you see with uh, equine viral arteritis. So uh, it, it's very specific to the head and neck region. And the edema in the neck 
can be very subtle or can be very widespread like we see with botulism. Is there a host? Uh, oh, is there a host in African horse fever or is it related to the environmental change? Uh, the only horse uh, host that has been currently identified is the zebra, which is really pretty much asymptomatic with infections with uh, African uh, horse sickness. However, I suspect there's probably a rodent that may act as a carrier animal as we find more and more of these viruses have other incidental hosts that we do not know about. And then is there any diagnostic value? Uh, let's see, oh, with the change of climate, what are the most important moving diseases to focus on in your opinion? Uh, I think our arboviral diseases have significant issues. Uh, Look at the uh, blue tongue uh, invading Europe 10 years ago. Uh, we're seeing, uh, I think our arboviral diseases will be the ones that will be spreading more uh, than other, other diseases. I think transportation and movement of animals, uh, since our economies are worldwide, uh, PPR will spread more and more like that. Same way with bird flu. And Let's see, is, is there any diagnostic values in using skin to detect PPR virus? No, uh, your PCR methods uh, to detect uh, PPR are, are very good. Uh, and skin lesions, we don't see the, the skin lesions like we do in dogs, in, in these animals. Uh, however, uh, because it, it is epidermal tropic, I would suspect you may be able to find skin lesions uh, in these animals, uh, but uh, your PCR of a nasal, nasal pharyngeal swab would, would be enough or lacrimal fluids, they're high viral uh, loads. Is there any other thing? I think that I answered all the questions.